Willie D Live. It's Willie D, y'all. Back with another episode of information and instructions to help you navigate through this wild, crazy, beautiful world. In the studio, Joe Tory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> My man. Say, man. Yeah, man. Uh, like I was telling you outside a moment ago, man. Give me some of that. Uh, <laughs> give me some of that youth juice. What, that youth man, juice. What, what, what do you do though? Like, what's what's hey, the regimen like? You know. I, I, I let God slap the shit out of me every day. That's, yeah. That's what it is. It's spout. You know, slap all the stupidness, all the, you know, everything you don't believe in. You know what I'm saying? All the crap out your head, man. Just slap it. You know what I'm saying? You blinking, you breathing. You ain't got no reason. You know what I'm saying? So that, that's that. And, that and, 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 dude, that's how, that's how I live. So, that's, that sounds you know like mean? a typical politician. <laughs> yeah, too. I was too. Like, I was like, man, we want to know, like, like specifically, man, what do you do to keep looking young? Uh, I will, you know, eat right. Work out. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. Like, you know what I'm saying? Laugh a lot. Yeah, laugh that's, a lot. That's good. Yeah. Laugh a lot. So, you, yeah. you know, and, and, and I tell people this, you know, I'm already dark. So chocolate and laughter is two of the best healing things in the world. Yeah. So if I happen to be a part of both of them, you know, I'm healing myself <laughs> through life as I go. Doing, you know, what I do as, as a career. Yeah. Jokes, comedy. So, you know, you know, I, I guess that's a, that's a part of it. And protecting your energy, huh? Keeping that. Oh yeah, man. Keeping that negativity away yeah, from yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. I, I learned how to change my vibration, change levels. You know what I'm saying? Go to a different dimension. You know, you don't fight the battles and or the wars that you know that you yeah. really ain't ain't really there. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? They just there for the moment. So I, I just learned how to you know, you know, navigate away from that. And then I guess it keeps you young, man. You know, look at you, man. You yeah, know what I'm saying? Well, you you're, know. you're it all wrinkled up. <laughs> well, I, you I got, just you be got your couple butter stories. going. You know, I, 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 got a, I got a few secrets. <laughs> yeah. I, just, I like to hear what everybody else is doing. You got to drink too, that water. Though. Yeah, I drink. Oh, man, I drink yeah. a lot of water yeah, every, I'm, every uh, day. Yeah, I'm, I drink water when I go to bed, too. Oh, yeah. And a lot of people say they don't like to do that because they may pee make them, you, at you, night. But but in the middle of the night is peeing is some of the best peeing you ever <laughs> get, though. You know, peeing in the middle of the night. You know, I, I used to, I used to, the, here's something crazy about that. I tested that theory. Mm. And for a long time, I wouldn't go to the restroom in the middle of the night. I could mm -hmm. drink 16 ounces of water right. and not have to go to the restroom in the middle of the night. Right. Like, Hadn't been like that lately. <laughs> lately, I'll probably go maybe once or twice, but right. I don't mind, you know, because I'm nosy. I like to okay. know what's going on around me. Right. So when I wake up in the middle of the night, I'd be trying to catch somebody off guard, like trying right. to break in or something. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you know, trying to hear something going on. Yeah. I'm looking yeah. out the window. Yeah, that's you know, me. Catch, it... catch me somebody getting out of pocket or yeah. something, you know, like I want to know what's going on. So I don't, I don't really mind getting up in the middle of the night. So so you got like a water <laughs> alarm. <laughs> yeah. You got a urine water alarm to get up. Just because right about that time, you know, crime is jumping around. Right. See, I don't like to sleep. You know, I give me a couple, three hours, and, I, and I'm good. So yeah. if I if I get up to pee, I'm up. I ain't going back to sleep. But but is, but isn't that like now? What are you doing when you when you're not sleeping? Are you working? Yeah, working, man. Yeah, I'm always working, writing, creating. I got so much stuff to do, man. You know, it's like you know, and I, I built like a studio in my house. So everything from editing to first I get first thing is get up and I just you know I deal with me, meditate. Yeah. Take in, you know, read some good affirmations or whatever comes to mind. You know what I'm saying? It, it just come to you. You know, yeah. if you know how to, you know, make make good energy come to you, then the proper programs will come on. You'll flip right to the proper, you know, TV program or radio station or whatever. You if you're going through IG or Facebook, the right things will come to you. It's like the algorithm knows. Okay, it's good energy time for you, and you start feeding that. And I do that before I even answer to the world. I don't send an answer. I don't. I don't text nobody back. I don't emails and nothing like. Like that before I get that out, I deal with me, I make peace with myself and the world, and then then I start dealing with it. You know what I'm saying so, okay, so that maybe that's where you get your balance from, you know, with that meditating and that that self care. You know, yeah. having that moment that you can do that daily, because from what I understand, that's pretty much what killed Robin Harris. Is that oh, yeah. working? He basically worked himself to death. Well, no, nah, he, he had they had heart issues in their problem. So he had, yeah, yeah, they had heart issues and already, you know, they had, you know, so had, he already yeah. had heart issues. Yeah, but so you don't think that him having all of that work? Well, he he was, him, he, had, was get, he was he was getting in shape. He had stopped eating late night. 
Yeah. You know, he probably just eat and drink and do everything, hang out, you know, late night. And I'm like, whoa, yeah. you know what I'm saying? But then uh, he had stopped. He stopped when he started doing movies because um, he had a whole list of stuff on his plate. But it just happened, man. I mean, it, it just, mm-hmm. well, you know, was was he going to the gym? Because he used to go to the gym a lot. Right. Had, got my gym membership. You know what I'm saying? Used to hoop and play basketball. Rob was in, he was in shape. He was a track star. But that that happened right there. Just it was just an, an unfortunate because I think his mother died like that and his father. So okay, all so them, this yeah. is something that that was yeah, in, the, in the family. Yeah, this is this is something that yeah that you know it just like he didn't work himself to death. Yeah. Now to me, you know John Witherspoon, because you know he worked work work. I mean John Witherspoon was on the the, the road like more than me, and I was like John, mm-hmm. you out of here? It's fifty two weekends in a year, and you like you know, and he was like yeah they working shit out of me man. I was like, yeah. I gotta tell my agent slow this down. And I was like, yeah, because I'm like, dude, this is this it's, it's a young man game when you got to get up you know, on these planes. You know what I'm saying? And then you have to be in shape to do that. Yeah, you know, I'm really. I mean, I'm in shape, but I have certain things that I do when I get off the plane. You know, to get beat, defeat the jet lag. You know what I'm saying? Or, or you know, I stand. I, you know, I do like an hourglass. I turn my body upside down and just get the blood up, new blood up to the to my my brain. And you know what I'm saying? I go work out and run, and I won't let that stuff catch up with me. I try to go to the gym and then shake all that stuff so I ain't got all that bacteria I ain't got all the people breathing on me I ain't got all that stress and anxiety hanging on me from flying and you know just going you know just traveling you know you know it's, it's rough and then being be able to do a show so that's one of my little things that I do but you know that stuff's a lifestyle man I've been doing this since I was like 12 yeah yeah I was a wrestler so I, I you know wrestled and boxed you played and football too right? played football yeah I went yeah. to college on a football wrestling scholarship right so. University of Missouri Lincoln University, yeah. Lincoln University. Yeah, HBCU. Okay. My, my sister oh. went to University of Missouri. She okay. had the big school. I went to right. Division Two. She went to University of Missouri. She had better grades. She was a better athlete at the time. Yeah, but the, 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 <laughs> what I need to know, though, who had the best training facility? <laughs> <laughs> Missouri did. <laughs> we do now. <laughs> I just came back from my homecoming. They just, man, they, oh my God. I'm like, it looks what's... state of art now? Oh, it's state of art, man. Yeah. They got something called the Link, a state of art gym in it, and, and football team. And, you know, I mean, I can show it. it is, it's, it's nothing like when I was there or when I went back, but it's beautiful. There's no reason why they should be losing. Yeah. Do they salute you when you go there? Oh, yeah, man. Yeah, I yeah. got just about every award that the, the school can give me. I got my honorary yeah. doctor from there, Lifetime Achievement yeah. Award from there. I think my bus is hanging up somewhere. And I, and I went back. I went back and spoke to the football team, did my Dion speech. What? Yeah, so, yeah, it was, I was, that was a proud moment, man. Could, could you ever imagine doing that when you were out there cutting up? <laughs> I heard you, boy, I heard you used to oh. be a, a habitual line stepper back in the gap oh, when man. you were in school. Yeah, I was, yeah, yeah, I was, <laughs> got locked up a lot. <laughs> I was there. I was. I was hey, what are you doing to get locked up in college, man? Dude, I was out of control. No <laughs> curfew. My daddy wasn't there. You know, because they were just two hours away from St. Louis. So, right. you know, I was essentially on my own, but getting into trouble, disturbing the peace, getting into fights, you know, rustling and throwing and stuff, and you know, and then doing stuff where you had to go to court. Now, now were you were you behaving like this because you felt a little invincible because you were on the wrestling team and you guys were being celebrated? You thought you could get away with it? No, nah, I was just young, stupid, and drinking yeah. and smoking, doing stuff I'd never done before. You know, back in my day, uh, it was like you're an athlete, so athletes don't do that. Yeah. So I did none of that in high school. I got to college. I was like, woo. Buck wild. Buck wild, man. Buck so wild. so the, the whole time that you're being raised by your parents, right. you know, there's... That's law Discipline. and order. Yeah. That's law and order. You yep. know what I'm saying? That's rules and regulations. Be in by 11.30, 12 right. o'clock. On my prom night, I had to be back at 12 o'clock. Right. On your prom night. Prom night. Okay. Well, <laughs> considering how things are today, man, you know, like I can't be mad at mom and pop. No, no, no. Yeah. And I had my dad's car. He was like, and he, and he I came home like at like 11.30. Can I hang out an extra hour. He said, well, by the time you go and where you're at, you, it's going to be time to bring my car back. So uh-huh. <laughs> take her home, come on back. I was like, yeah. and you'll be back by 12. I was like, oh, come on, Pop. So, yeah, a little rebellion, a little freedom, you know what I'm saying, a little growing up. And then you get your own car, you get your own house. And I was a DJ, so I threw my own parties. So I, I was just, man, I was just all over the place, man. You know. Was you making money throwing those parties? Yeah, man, yeah. I, I used what, to make what, cassettes. What you charge? Uh, back in the day, if you yeah. bring me a 40-ounce, 
And, you know, depends on whether the tape was 30 minutes or 60 minutes or 90 minutes. It's $5, $10, or yeah. $15. Yeah. And I still got some, you know, some nice slow mixes. You know, if you wanted to make love to your girlfriend, I've had some nice, you know, uh, you know, just made my own little mixtapes. And then if you wanted to kick it at a party, did that thing, man. I had me a nice, yeah, I, I did I did after parties. Had me a little six cross fader I got from a pawn shop. Got me some Jensen speakers. Dude, I was there. Now, now where did you get this hustling mentality from? St. Louis, I guess. Or, or being a military brat, seeing my father yeah. just do do Your a lot of was stuff. In the Army, right? Yeah, my dad's Mississippi, yeah. so yeah, he's, yeah. yeah he, he did all that. He was straight from high school to war. Two tour, two tours of Vietnam. Yeah, two he was, tours. In yeah, Vietnam. he was. Yeah, he was. He was did, a real deal. Let me see. Did you know he was in Vietnam when when he was in Vietnam? No, right? no. you just know he was an Army man, and he used to go away and come. You back. didn't know he was in the water. No, you didn't know yeah. the war was going on. You kind of did, but you didn't know what it was at that time. Um, Cause I, we're all base babies, so I was born in you know Newport News, Fort Eustis in Virginia. My little brother, and they were born in in, in uh, Seaside, California. You know that's why I'm a Raider fan, cause that was my first uniform. Right. So I was like that age. I was up and then then we went to Seaside. No, we then went to Jamaica Queens, New York. That's when my mother was getting away from him, cause he used to come back yeah. PTSD. You know, yeah, you're choking people in the middle of the night, <laughs> drunk. Yeah, he yeah. was. Yeah, he was. He was. Yeah, he needed. He needed a little time to, you know, get himself together. And that's how I got to St. Louis. We just went from there to Jamaica Queens to St. Louis, and that's when he retired and just, you know, finished. Came back to the fam and yeah, instilled that more discipline. He was very strict. Oh yeah, he played. So, the, who got the most whippings out of you? And oh you? me, I mean, oh, I mean, oh, I, yeah. I, I, out of you and, and God. Yeah, me, me, who I got, got the most whippings. Beatings, whoopings. <laughs> Punishments. You got the most whippings out of all of your the, you, all the it's kids. Five of y'all, it's six of y'all. It's right? six of us, yeah. And who you got the most whippings out of everybody. No, man, I got it. I got it. I got now, it. now, now why, why were you continuing to get all of these whippings, <laughs> man? Like, you, you, you hey, just, just hard headed or what? I like, used to get whooped when we used to go visit. Uh, relatives, they used to be like, where he at? And just start whooping me. Yeah, just for in case you do something. I used to be like, for real? Yeah. Yeah, you look like, yeah, we heard about you. I used to be like, for real? Uh, you know, but, man, I was just a jokester, you know. And then I, I thought I was strong, so I used to pick, I used to, like, pick grown-ups up. Now, you can't pick me up. And I'd pick them up, get up on their feet, and slam them on the ground. Like, what the, they little dudes strong, <laughs> especially when they was drunk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, now, now did, did you have the type of relatives that didn't want you to come spend the night because they thought you was the bad kid, but they yeah. let your other siblings come over? Yeah. That was yeah. me. Yeah, that was you too. Yeah, it was like hey, anybody but him. Yeah, <laughs> like what's wrong? I ain't gonna do nothing. Yeah, but yeah. the true part about it is that some of my other cousins, who my aunts were allowed to visit them, they were just as bad, but they were sneaky with it. Yeah, it was like you know, like my brother. Yeah. Oh my God, the guys is sneaky with it. I remember one time, man, he uh, he was trying to play basketball with us. My father was like, you know, I asked me, they had like movie night. It was like a nickel night or something like that. And my father was like, nah, you can't go. You know, and I was like, whatever. So um, so he thought I was mad about it. So I'm in the backyard playing basketball. He on the couch sleeping. And then my little brother come out and he trying to play with, with us. And he was like, you know, you're four years younger than us. Come on, man. You stop, you know. You know, and he's just in the way. He couldn't really play. So he's like, get your little brother, man. So I was like, go on, man. So he, he took a rock and hit me in the back. With the rock, and tried to run in the house, and I grabbed him, and I slammed him all over the backyard, and we didn't really have no court. It was dust, it was mud, so he went in there looking like pig pen, and um, yeah, and he, Joe whoop me, beat me. And my father just man, my father, he didn't ask no questions. He just and I was like, wait a minute, he hit me with a brick. But my, my father bounced me off the basketball court. <laughs> <laughs> he bounced me off. The, he bounced me. He beat me in front of my, my I, and I ran away for like two weeks. And I was like, "What?" And he, I was like, "What?" And I said, "He was like, you, you just mad? You don't do that to your brother? And you, you, you mad because you couldn't go to the movies?" And I was like, and guy sitting back there laughing and no looking like he did something. I'm like this, he was the one. He was hit me with. I didn't do this. Right. But I never forget that. Did you resent your father for doing nah. that to you? Nah, man. You nah, man. I mean, you know, I had the best two weeks of my life. You know what I'm saying? I went and ran, you know, my, my uh, best friend, you know, uh, my girlfriend would stay down, <laughs> down from, they would live in these apartment complex, so I, she happened to stay downstairs. So, hey, it was cool. <laughs> it was yeah. like, and my father, the thing was, it hurt me, and my father didn't even come look for me. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> Your daddy, like, one less mouth to feed. 
Yeah. I was in school. So I'm like, uh, bring me some clothes and with my older brother. And I said, he looking, he ain't asked about you, man. I said, I ain't even come look for me, man. <laughs> I was like, man. He's now, like, how yeah. old were you at that time? Um, I, I was a sophomore, so I had to be about 16, maybe 15, 16. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. About, about that time. <laughs> man, you have had a storied life. Mm. Like, like, you have been in some very important rooms with very important people. You've done some very important work. Work that is going to go down in the annals of history, like in pop, pop culture. Like, you have, like, you're really that type of dude, you know, mm. like, and when, when, I, when, I, when I look at the, the totality of your work, I mean, like, it's so many roles that you play, and you steal the show. Like you're 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 st you're a show stiller. You you typically wouldn't play the big roles, yeah. but it be a big role. It end up being a big role just because of your impact. You know, for example, the, the role that you played in Poetic Justice. Mm. That role right there, like I was wanting more of. I wanted more of Joe. Oh, I want to. I want to. Let, let me back up. My, my fault. I was being disrespectful. I wanted more of Chicago. Chicago. I wanted more Chi Town, right. baby. You know, like Chi Town. How did you even get that role? Um, that role came about with John meeting John. I met mm -hmm. John at the Comedy Act Theater, watching Robin Harris when I first got out here. And John had written Boys in the Hood. I didn't know really know who he was. He was in the back of the Comedy Act Theater, looking all goofy and nerdy. And I used to be in this improv group, just myself, Ricky Harris. We used to always do anything to get on stage. Robin was yeah, running yeah, court. Yeah, R.P. Ricky, yeah, Ricky Harris. Yeah. So we was like trying to get up on stage. So we, we, we was in this improv group where uh, we would get up and for 30 minutes before Robin Harris got on, we warmed the audience up doing these skits. And um, and everybody was, I was the wildest one in there. And people were like, oh, you're funny. You're the crazy one, you know. So we, you know, we like your character. And so I was like doing anything. And then John was like, I'm, I'm going to put you in a movie one day. You funny. And I was like, whatever. And he said, you country too. Where you from? <laughs> I was like, St. Louis. But he thought, he was like, Chicago sound better mm -hmm. when it came to the movie. So um, Robbie Reed, they was, this is like a melting pot of, you know, to get a star is born or where you, if you need to be on stage. Robin mm -hmm. Harris, Comedy Act Theater, Friday, Saturday, you know what I'm saying? Or Thursday, Friday, Saturday when, he, when it got hot. Um, and you would get the agents in there and try to get on stage. This is where I, I introduced Jamie Foxx to his agent and all that. I got Jamie Foxx's agent. Yeah, you agent. got Jamie Foxx's first agent. His first, yeah, we, yeah. We, we took his as a package deal. I was like, yeah, look at Jamie too. Because um, Jamie, Eric Bishop, um, <laughs> his name is Jamie Foxx, but was, you know, he was trying to get noticed and trying to get on. But, but then, you know, you didn't have a name, you didn't have no connections. You just need to be in the right place at the right time. And um, that was one of the, the things that, that happened to me. So, um, I saw John. I came from auditioning for Strictly Business, <laughs> and because uh, I wanted to really lead part, um, but they, they, you know, I wouldn't. Have, I didn't have a name like Tommy. Um, you wanted the lead part. Was it Strictly? Was strictly, strictly Business. business. Yeah, the, I went for the lead. And that that was uh, Halle, Halle Berry. Berry. Yeah. Sam Jackson. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I had the mail room. So they gave me that part in the mail room because they was like, "You did good, man." I was like, "Yeah, but I'm with the lead." Like, well, we'll put you in the yeah. movie, but and that, that movie got me in a union. That was my first little tap Hartley. I did first. I did Talking Dirty After Dark, and then that's the other movie that got me another historic film with there a lot of so many damn yeah, stars in that in that movie, movie right? Man. Yeah, like how they pay for all those people? Well, back then, you know, it was SAG ultra low budget, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> really didn't have to pay Sam them. But Jack was in that movie. So, so many yeah. people in that movie, man. Like, like, well, some you did. Me, I just wanted to get into the business, so you take what you can get at the time. Mm -hmm. You need the qualification, the speaking role in the movie, then you get another one, get you into it, you know, and then you're in the union just trying forever. To get the credits, yeah. Yeah, you need the credits. You need the speaking. You need the speaking. Parts. Yeah. So, you know, it's like, okay, anything to get there, and I'll just keep inching my way. Um, but no, John kept his word. I saw John at a uh, at Robbie Reed's uh, annual picnic, barbecue that she has every summer, mm -hmm. and we sat at the table, and he's like, man, I just I wrote Boys in the Hood, and, and I, we, man, I got this perfect role for you, and for real, we sat and talked for like an hour and a half, and he mm -hmm. introduced me to uh, Regina King, and even because Regina, he had a Regina in mind, he had Ice Cube in mind. And he had uh, and Janet in mind. That was his stuff. And he fought for that. That was when his vision, that's what he wanted. And he he, uh, he, he was like, yo. They was like, who's this dude? And it was like, ah, he's good. 
and so you know, stuck with it. He wanted Ice Cube for the Pac role. Yeah. And how did Pac end up getting the role over Ice Cube? Well, Cube didn't want to. He didn't. He wanted to play. Well, from now hearing it from his mouth, he didn't like the way he was like he didn't he wasn't cool with the character the way this character kind of did. Um, his buddy Chicago, he was saying like that, and and I heard he wanted to kind of change some of the roles. He wanted to play my role, you know, with the, with, with with and have go through that conflict with the woman and stuff like that. And then it was like at the time too, well, he didn't really want to be doing a romance comedy because the way his career was going so he mm-hmm. so he wasn't calling John back and he was just you know so it didn't work out and this is what John told me mm-hmm. John was like he wouldn't call me back it'd be difficult and blah 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 blip and you know he was talking about asking about your role and he was and John was like nah the roles are the role the characters are the characters so oh so John Singleton stood on oh, yeah. your character. He yeah. said, like, no, I got my man for that role. Yeah, but, but, but he also had the relationship down, too. See, Cube wanted to change the relationship between... He, he was saying... When I heard Cube say it, he said he didn't want... He, a real dude wouldn't do his buddy like that, like leave him outside the role, and they wouldn't be... You know, they would, they, they would be different. And John was like, no, it is what it is. Now... Refresh my memory about that. Exactly about the movie what happened. Well, well I, I know about the. I, I remember. Yeah. Well, in, in I the, remember the movie, but yeah. I don't. Rem, I'm not crystal clear on exactly what happened. What part he's talking about, where a real dude well, would leave like, his buddy. Like they on left the me on the side of the road, and I was fighting a woman and all that stuff like that. And he was like, he wouldn't have done that because you know it was, that was a sucker move. You know, to like you know see mm. that you know the girl was drunk and I mean not. You know, I'm trying. I'm just remember, trying to remember what Ice Cube was saying. But he was like the role that the relationship between Lucky and Chicago, Tupac, you know, what I'm saying, and myself. He didn't like the way John had it. It was like some of it was suckerish, you know, what he was doing, and he didn't want to kind of play that, you know, at at at, at that time. He wanted to juice it up and be a little bit more hardcore. I wonder, you know, yeah, you know, and I know Cube well. Me and mm-hmm. Cube have been friends for a long time. I'm wondering if Cube would take that same position today. You know, I think he answered that too. I forgot what he said. You know what I'm saying? I, I don't. I don't think he would because I. I would. I, I'm gonna tell you like, I, I would leave his ass on the side of the road. <laughs> like you, you know, like you boxing on a woman. Uh, yeah. You know, I'm gonna leave you on the. Yeah, I leave you on the side of the road. Wait a minute, but didn't he leave Janet on the side of the road? <laughs> Who? <laughs> I mean, the, the character. The, see that character as well. Left Tupac and left Janet on but the side of the road. He didn't want to play that character. He, yeah, he, exactly. he wanted to play your character. Or he just wanted to play that. Or he wanted to play Lucky. And he didn't want to get left on the side of the road. He, he, he wanted to play him a little. He, I think he said a little less suckerish. You know what I'm saying? Because remember, yeah. he put Janet out. He yeah. put me out. You know what I'm saying? So I guess it was. He had a little conflict and with I, the I character. And I put a woman out before. I mean, yeah, a couple times. Uh, you know, like. But if, if that's well, not. I wouldn't do it. Yeah. To, but I wouldn't do it today, though. You know what I'm saying? But, right. but then again, that was then. That was then. They I were, they were 20 that. something. 20 <laughs> something? Yeah, I didn't know no better. So I would have. I would have probably put it out back. Yeah, I would have put it out in the middle back of the, then. It depending on how I felt, <laughs> especially if you want to get out. I remember when I was eighteen years right. old, man, and I'm with my girl, man, and and she, she we were arguing about something. I don't even know what it was, and she was like, "Let me out," and we were on like this dark road in Fifth Ward. <laughs> right, 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 right. It was dark, bro. We were like in like in the uh, what do they call it? The the Factory district, you know, nothing but factories and stuff back here, like off of, back, back in Fifth Ward. Right. And uh, she was like, let me out. I was so mad at I just pulled over and I let her out. And I drove back to, to her house. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> I drove back to her house. Which was like maybe a five minute drive or something. So wow. that means she had a good 20 minute walk. Right. She had about a good 20, 25 minute walk or something like that. Mm. In any event, when I pulled up, mm. uh, let me see, uh, no, it wasn't even five minutes. Anyway, it was a, she probably pulled up in about 30 minutes or so, so I don't know how long it was. Anyway, she pulls up and uh, she walks up, and her brother and his buddies are standing outside. Right. Mm. I pull up first, <laughs> and he asked me. He asked me where where she was. <laughs> I like, hey, she 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 walking. He's like, well, you yeah, you put my you, you put my aside. I said, no, nah, man, she wanted to get out. She asked me to get out the car, so I let her out. Right. 
<laughs> and then she come walking up, and she she was mean mugging me. She walked up and and just walked right past, past me. Everybody. I never saw her again. Wow. Yeah, but uh, I wouldn't advise that today. Yeah. That is a bad bad idea. Yeah. Wherever you pick a woman up at, you, yeah. That's where you need to drop her back off at. Yeah. You know, if that's where she if that's where she's going, right? right. If that's her final destination. Like I heard a guy was talking about flying women in and if she don't put out, right. don't fly her back. <laughs> that is a bad, bad idea. Yeah, that's a terrible idea. You mess around and yeah. get caught up in a situation where a woman yeah. is going. You know, she might decide to go there and accuse yeah. you of something you did exactly. not do. Exactly. So, fellas, if y'all out there, y'all listen to me, you listen to me good. You make sure that woman get back home, that girl get back home safely. Yeah, I don't, I don't just fly in and, you know, they yeah. don't put out. I mean, yeah. You know. But, you know, I mean, it's a two-way street there, too. Don't be flying in. If, you know, you think you're flying in for That's a good idea. It's right like, there. you know, come on, yeah. what are you doing? But then they may fly in and be like, hey, okay. Maybe you, 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 one of your tooth are bad, your breath stink, your feet small. You, you know what I'm saying? It could well, be, you know, it could be something on the internet that ain't true. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know what I mean? They'll say, yeah. You well, know, women, flying women. in ain't no different than just, you know, yeah. going to an expensive restaurant. That don't guarantee you're going to get some just right. because you spent $200. You're right about it. You know, uh, or 300 or 400 but if well, they whatever they spend in these days you know they like to spend big money now for you know 200 dollars right. ain't nothing they probably oh that ain't no money somebody out there saying that ain't no money yeah. uh i spent 1500 <laughs> on my date the other day at the restaurant uh, for what <laughs> you know what i'm saying would you invest in that I, nah, for real <laughs> to get to say in your belly your your, hand, your stomach's no bigger than your hand so what, what, what are you doing you what's the I'm most you'll spend at the restaurant on girl let's say you're dating you just yeah. dating her. you just started Dating, y'all been out, y'all been going out two weeks. I mean, I would say we. I like to drink. Okay. So you know, it's gonna be at least be three hundred dollars at least. At, it, it depends on where you're going to. If we're going what, somewhere what like you, Papa Do's. We're going somewhere like you know, maybe maybe getting two fifty. But I, but yeah, I keep it under three. I, I keep it under three hundred. I drink mm-hmm. Tito's, uh, you know, or vodka, or I make you know, celebration. I may you know, I may step it up a notch, but I can put down some drinks. So yeah. most of the most of the bill is gonna be most drinks of the with me. Is your, your bill. <laughs> exactly. Right. Right. So yeah, because I mean, you know, I mean, I you know, I don't date. Well, I'm married, but I mean, when I do date and and I have go out, you know, I do go out on dinner dates and stuff. I'm not spending, you know, I'm not. You know, what are you, you eating? Chicken and hamburger? I mean, what what costs that much? Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm, I've, I've tasted some good food, and I'm a great chef myself, so. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You know. So who cooked the most, you or your woman? Oh, me, man. You do, yeah. you do most of the cooking? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I can burn, man. What do you I think about cooking. these red pill dudes who say women should be cooking, not men? Oh, man, I mean, yeah. That's what they say. <laughs> you go <gonna> starve. <laughs> I like to eat. I like to eat. I like it to taste the way I wanted to taste. So I cook it. Nobody can. Nobody can do that better than you. You didn't. So you if got you know that chef cook. style cooking down. Oh man, presentation I, yeah. and everything. Yeah. Well, it depends on what it is. But I got. I got some presentation. And you know, I'm yeah. five star. Am I going on the front of a magazine? I'm more of the bunker, backyard barbecue, kitchen cook, right. get your meal. You know what I'm saying? I ain't. I ain't about to. You know, you gonna get some lamb chops. You can Steak, what you want? You don't get that same food, yeah. But it's gonna be more wholesome, uh, you know. It's gonna and be it's gonna be prepared. Oh yeah, it's gonna yeah. Be, well, I live in LA, it's gonna get so get to the table quicker. Oh yeah, come on, man. Right. Yeah, and it's gonna yeah, it ain't gonna be all that you know you know like vegan, you know. And I, I don't eat if it ain't. It, I got it. It got to be done. I ain't eating nothing raw, unless it's vegetables. Man, how did you get the acting the acting buzz? You know, did what came first, the acting buzz or the comedy mm. buzz? I know that you you did comedy first. We got to know you right. for your comedy first. But what came first as far as the buzz for you, acting or a comedy? Um, comedy, because I'm you know naturally comedy is is what I do, what I can mm. get away with freely in school. Because all this is designed, you know. And I saw Sammy Davis Jr. like you know in that little TV back in the day when I was a kid, and I used to see him. He used to be on everybody's show back then. You only had NBC, ABC, CBS, mm-hmm. and the big shows back then. He'd be on all of them, and he'd be doing something different: acting, singing, dancing. Yeah. I was like, "Why? Wait, wait, playing with pistols, mashing?" I was like, yeah. "Oh my God, who is this little <laughs> bad black man?" Yeah. I, I got to get inside that TV. And so I tried to emulate Sammy Davis Jr. He was a, a, a guide for me. And then the Nat King Coles, and you see the James Browns, 
And then you then but this dude could do anything, man. So I kind of patterned my lifestyle after, you know, Sammy Davis Jr. I don't have as I don't have as many talents that he has. So I kind of just okay, got to speak well. So you know, okay, art, you got to articulate. You know, you got to be able to, if you want to be in this business, you want to be able to act. You can't be able to sound like you're from somewhere. You should be able to master every little dialect. So mm. I took speech and I took that stuff hmm. seriously when I went to different places. When I was in New York, I used to sound like New York. I was in New York for a while, so I used to move and you used to sound like you in the park, the car, you you know, St. Louis, or you. So you just pick up and down the South. You know, you pick up they little it's the slang and. You know, you got no difference with Spanish people. You know what I'm saying? Mexicans are la- more lazy with this beach. You know what I'm saying? And Puerto Ricans, they talk for casa. You know, Latin people, they go, you know, it's a little quicker. So it's like you got a, these little ear things that you hear and living in those places, you know, kind of make me take all that to stage. So I'm like, okay, I have a plethora of stuff to add when I'm doing comedy, when I'm acting, because I used to see Sammy do it. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's kind of my thing. So whatever came first, athletes, you know, the athletic system came first because that was our key. You know, you know, my thing was to be known, get on TV, and hopefully, you know, do the, you know, even OJ was cool back then, but, you know, right maybe now he's not, but you seen him running through the airport, and you was like, okay, is that the way you have to make it if I can't sing and I can't dance? Like, you know, so you've been an athlete, and then, oh, maybe they get me into acting because he had a lot of acting roles, had a lot of commercials. And I was like, man, okay, another bad black man on TV. How do you do that? And mm-hmm. so I'd be a good athlete. So I try to get all hone all these things into to a stage or to be able to be seen or to be able to present myself to like do exactly what I'm doing now. Mm-hmm. Entertainment. Yeah. Man, how real was that smack you gave Regina King? <laughs> <laughs> how how real was the kick? She kicked me. I, I, I Ask me that. <laughs> was that real? How real was Dude, the kick? She must have kicked me about 50, 60 times. And then it took a break. Oprah was there too. How close did it get to you? Man, to it, a lot, a lot, because it was like you know she had to keep kicking in the supposed to be the camera angle, but it looked like she was supposed to kick me in my private part. But uh-huh. she kept kicking me in my my hamstring or on my thigh, so it looks like you know you got it in there, and, and it was like yeah, ah, yeah, try it again. That looked, nah. that looked like a real fight, man. Yeah, well, it looked like now Tupac and I we did have a little something because he was he was tripping back then. He was a little high and mm-hmm. he was getting he was feeling himself. He punched me in the mouth a couple of times. Didn't want to wear shoulder pads. Didn't want to wear knee knee things. And, and it was like, yo, you fighting on gravel? He was he was just getting wild. So he punched you in the mouth a couple of times. Yeah, dude, that did was like, dude, you, did dude. You get any licks in? Oh, I slammed the shit out of his ass. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I slammed the, I the shoulder. What, what, what Fox say when you slam? <laughs> Ow, on that ground. <laughs> <laughs> got up. He, he put that braid. He put that shoulder thing on. I mean, God rest his heart. But, but yeah, you better go put that on stunt uh, shoulder thing on because it's a pad you're supposed to have. I don't need none of that. Rock it all up. Yeah. We got it. <laughs> I was like, dude, because it's you got to time the stuff. He was he got it all into it, and he meant to punch me too. Yeah. Cause I was I had, I was talking about him because he was he started being late toward the end of the movie, so I used to just crack on him all the time, talk about it, you know, about his hair falling out and he's fingernail, he's always chewing on his nails. But he was going through that stress thing. We didn't know it at the time. Uh, he was going through that. But then later, but I used to always talk about him. I used to tell him he's like a magpie. You know what I'm saying? So, sitting over there by himself, you know, because he's you late, man. I'm joining on you. I'm cracking on you. And Janet and Regina used to be laughing like he go he go get you. So he punched me for real. During the fight scene, he plop, plop. I was like, dude, okay. Now, what kind of excuse would he give you for being late? You know, I think he just running out of weed. And the closer we got to Oakland, <laughs> he was making weed runs. Because <laughs> we actually drove the whole way. Like, that's a six, seven hour. Uh. Yeah, so, but that we made it a trip. The, the 12 weeks that we stopped in certain places and filmed. Uh. Yeah, okay. so in between, they were real weed. So the closest place is either going back to L.A. or going to Oakland. So it's either three or two hours that way. It depends on how further we we were on the trip. And and you know that's what it was. He was you know he was good. But I'm you know I wasn't smoking weed like that then. You know how do I do? I I get it. I was like yeah I'd have been like where my weed at? Somebody go get it. Because his brothers used to go get it. You know what I'm saying? But then he used to. It, 
you know, have somebody come get him. <laughs> but, man, what, or he used to just trill because we because we was out there in the boonies, man. We were out there. There's nothing up against that, you know. If you're traveling, St. Louis Obispo, it's like peacocks and and there's niceness. But you know, they blowing the biggest thing in town is they shooting pool and blowing glass. You know what I'm saying? It was a glass town. You we live in little cities like that where we were, you know, we just go and throw darts and you know. We, but it was it was a good expression to get out of the city. John, John was magnificent with that. Yeah. Man, what's the true story behind the kiss, though? The kiss that um, they said that uh, something about Janet was no. asking Pac to go take an AIDS test. No, no, that, that was Janet's stuff. people. That was her people yeah. saying that? So at the beginning of the movie— But she had to agree to it. No, at the beginning of the movie, she uh, she got a cold. Q-Tip had a cold. Remember, she kissed Q-Tip mm-hmm. before he got shot. You know what I'm saying? That was a boyfriend before that. So that's why she was writing that poetry and going through that stuff. But she caught a cold. Mm-hmm. So she couldn't work for like three, four days. How did she know she got it from Q-Tip? She did, because he had a cold. Okay. Yeah, so, but then you had to adjust stuff. So, you know, but when Janet don't work, about 20 people don't work. Just really quick, though. She kissed because they tip knowing he had a cold. No, I mean, but they, they, they traced it back to that because okay. she couldn't come, and right. you know, and then when the one kiss, they had seen kissing in the car, yeah. doing that stuff, you know. So right. whatever it was, Janet back then, Janet it was a business and a brand. So it's, mm-hmm. she come with the whole crew. You know what I'm saying? How many people? Um, well, I, I would say on the set, she probably had like six people with her, just security, and then you know, her, her handlers and stuff like that, food cooks like that. But she was a professional. Professional. I work with Janet anytime. The 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 easiest, the most comfortable, the the, the best. Uh, a team player. And I'm saying she loaded up her trailer, and they told her they need her back for another shot. She came back, unpacked, boom, did her stuff. Yeah, Janet was always professional, always on time, always stay late, always there. True professional. She but seemed to be that way. I seen she her in a lot of those Tyler Perry movies and stuff, and she seemed to be. She just seems easy going. If man. She, she wasn't. Yeah. We'd know. Yeah, you know. She used to come to my trailer and just talk to me by herself. It. And I'd yeah. you know, come to my room and, Joe, what you doing? We used to go out to Malibu. She used to have, you know, um, she she helped me with my worth ethic and we're working out. Mm-hmm. We'd be out there doing jet skiing and barbecuing and Pac, for real, before the Pac thing. We used to, Virginia King, we'd be all out there with the little Jackson, Tito and them sons and stuff, jet skiing. And I'm like, where'd Janet go? And she'd be gone. She'd disappear for like an hour. And he's like, oh, she's upstairs working out. And I'm like, what? And she had a gym built in. Her trainer would be over there working out. And she'd be like, what? So she was kicking it with us for about two hours. And so the trainer came over like around, you know, five. And she worked out. And she came back, kicked kick it again, ate some food. It was like, got it in. She, a machine. So those abs were real. She really works, really sweats. And now I'm like, okay, I need to get a gym in my house. Okay, I need to be doing this. You just pick up little things about how how to be a star. Right. And and she was very professional with that. Right. But I'm saying when I saw that happen when um she, she got cold from Q tip. So when Tupac was, you know, Tupac was feeling himself. Remember Tupac was twenty, turned twenty one at mm-hmm. the time. So uh when he was feeling himself, he was, you know, he was he was he had a lot of girls in and out the trailer. He laid, he was doing what he wanted to, okay? And then they had a little thing about there, okay, girls are saying saying stuff like, okay, he, I think he gave me STD or kinky. It, it was something about he had a dirty dick or something like that. But I guess girls are saying that because he was, oh, well, because this one running out the trailer, this one left eye was here, this one was over here, this one was up. He was running them, they, they were just in and out. So it looked like, okay, he getting busy. So her people and them saw that, they was like, eh. Before we get really, 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 really deep, because they're going to have a, a more intense love scene. They got a kiss. They're going to be there for, you know, it's like a day. They're supposed to have love scene, make love on the beach and all that. That scene was supposed to be a lot longer than what it was. It got shortened because, one, Tupac was not showing up. And then, two, he was, you know, the, his, I guess his activity kind of scared them. So they was like, uh, and that and that age was like new then. People didn't know. So it was like, yeah, we need, might need to get an age test. Because they don't work. And then, But, you know, Janet would have never did that. Janet, Jan, Jan, that, that ain't even Janet. She was just a trooper, and she did, did for real. And she used to, I used to talk to her about that. She's like, I didn't say that. I didn't do that. To your knowledge, no. did the test ever happen? Um, no, they never did. They never, they never, they never got. Tupac refused the test, right? Yeah, but by then, you know, people were getting tired of Tupac. He was, you know, he was showing up three, four hours late. You know what I'm saying? It was like, come on, let's get the scene over with. Because mm-hmm. I think they they were trying to fire him, actually, but they couldn't because there was so much into it. And that last, I wasn't, like, I didn't work the last week. 
But so they just wanted to get that scene over with in, in the movie and get him out and be done with it. Yeah. Man, you are a great storyteller. And one of the greatest stories that I've ever heard you tell. <laughs> no, what's the story? No, no, we're gonna, we're gonna come back. We're gonna come back. We're gonna circle back around to that. But one of the greatest stories I ever heard you tell was when you met Russell Simmons <laughs> and how dismissive of him you were. Yeah, <laughs> can you share that with the audience? Yeah, cause I used to see Russell Simmons after you know, but I didn't know who he was. Yeah, so Russell used to come to the comedy act theater, Stan Layton, Russell Simmons. Um, and who else? Uh, Ralph Farquhar. So he great writers. Um, but I didn't know what they had in mind. These are the old cats in there, you know, and they didn't figure it out Hollywood, but they're thinking about Def Jam. So when they see certain comedians and stuff, so I used to see Russell, but I didn't know. I see he was just always be drunk, badly dressed, you know what I'm saying? And then he slobbering and yeah, he, you're funny, man. You take my number. He would do some things with you. And I was like, who the hell is this dude? <laughs> right? So he wrote his number down, scribbled it on something. I threw that shit away. <laughs> so uh uh Rodney Tanksley, who was, who was, he was Robin Harris's valet and Robbie Reed's boyfriend, was like, what, what did you just say to you? I said, me talking about trying to manage me and stuff, you know, and he, you know, he, man, it, some, just somebody else talking crap. He said, he want to manage you. He want to, what he want to do? And he got some stuff for you. He said, man, he said, did he give you his number? I said, yeah, man, I threw that shit away. He was like, <laughs> he was in where? <laughs> I said, the trash can. He went dog three, so you better find a number. That's Russell Simmons, man. I said, who the hell is Russell Simmons? He's like, Crush Groove, uh, Run DMC. And I was like, oh, snap. <laughs> you started looking for I'm the number two. I'm digging in for that number two, dog. In front of everybody. He was in that trash can. <laughs> oh, it ain't on this hot dog. <laughs> Did you ever find the number? Um, yeah, we found it, but, you know, it didn't. It, it, he kept coming back around, but then I found a number, but it wasn't, you know, it was like, okay. But they kept coming, so it was like, okay, you got the number. We got you on the line. But, it, but Russell would be drunk, so I don't even yeah. know if he remember giving me the number. Right. Because he would go back to New York and then stand, and then people were like, okay, you're on the list. But but I was I was chosen as one of the ones that was going to be um, on Def Comedy Jam, but Robin Harris was supposed to be the first host. Yeah, and... Yeah. and- then uh, Martin got the got got the job, and right. you came in after Martin. You took right. over. You took. I mean, you done this. You had already done this before when you took over for uh, Robin Harris. Harris. Yeah. yeah, You know, on a big stage. Even though right. you know we talking about three hundred people, we talking about the Comedy Act Theater. Yeah, that was. We talking about that was the hardest the Epic Center at that time. The, epic, the epicenter at that time oh, yeah. for for comedy. Yeah. You know. Yeah. yeah. That was a big deal. Like, w- did you feel any type of, uh, uh, I guess, intimidation at all about doing 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 that? Uh, no, with Robin MCM? Harris taking over from who? From Robin Harris yeah. or from? Um, no, Robin Harris is our. We, you know, the year that I knew him, a little over a year that I knew him, I got there in March of '89. He died in March of '90. Um, took me in. We just clicked right away, man. Um, bought me my first pair of hundred dollar shoes. <laughs> yeah, I wore the shit out of the shoes. <laughs> He's come pick me up. What? Y'all first when you first met him, mm-hmm. you you were, oh. you were heckling him, right? Heckling. I tried to heckle you, him. You, you heckled Robin Harris. I didn't know like, who he, I didn't one know of the who greatest he was, rank. No, I didn't know comedians at the time. of all time. I, I just got to L.A. I'm the coldest ranking from where I come from. Who's this fat dude? And he was pop, 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 pop. Man, he shot me down, man. Shot me down. I felt like I was this small, like Fred Flintstone, a little seat. And he ran me up out of there, put the light on me, man. And then the whole table was mad because then he started messing with the table. And I was like, we, yeah, we do. You know? <laughs> it was like, get him out of here. I was like, I was like well, I wouldn't try that. I don't ever try that to get him. So I was like, but then Robin Harris and Ronaldo Ray used to, take me around and put me up on stage, the hardest spots in L.A., and then heckle me. And I was like, I, and my mentors, I used to be like, man, why are y'all heckling me? The first time they did it, what was your response? I didn't know how to take it because I usually talk about people, but I was like, and they were just killing me, both of them, whap, whap, whap. So after about the second, third time they did that, I mean, I lit into both of them. <laughs> Robert was mad. You was ready. Oh, yeah, because I was like, you know what, teacher? <laughs> I'm hitting back this time. And yeah. I got a couple good shots in. And I said some stuff, you know. And, he was, and Ronaldo <laughs> laughed because it was, you know, but, but Robin was mad at me for a while. And he was like, he said, no, you, you did what you're supposed to do. 
though. Let nobody drive you off that stage. These were and these were ghetto places like in LA. Yeah. These were no comedy club. This was like juke joint bands and they doing comedy on Wednesday night. <laughs> and you you know, you gotta get in there before that window. You know what I'm saying? They doing a, a break. So you got forty minutes to get up there and Robin's gonna mess around for ten minutes and and people just wanna see the band. It's loud, people going up. Man, they, man, they used to I had somebody they throw some change at me. Get off stage. I'm throwing you money. Get off stage. I was like, <laughs> hit me in the face with it, dude. <laughs> Get off. Is that for being funny? No, nah, man. We want the band back. I was like, <laughs> what the hell? I was like, hey. Wow. Yeah, man. That was that was that was L.A. comedy at first. Red Onion. Oh man, you be Robin had he had to walk me to my car one time with a pistol. Gangbangers joning on you. So when I got the best of them, they want to fight and shoot me outside. <laughs> <laughs> like, I was like, I'll fight all three of y'all. And it's like, there's three more coming. Oh, it's six of y'all. <laughs> and, and so Robin. Yeah. He, oh, Robin. Was, he was getting you ready. That's yeah. when he was heckling you. Heckling me. He was getting you ready. Yeah. For what you, he was getting you ready for those those spots, those hood yeah. spots. Hood spots. Yeah. And, yeah. But at the same time, um, I'd seen him go up and do the comedy store behind Andrew Dice Clay. When Dice Clay is his, you know, standing out, Dice Clay was the man. And they tried to put Robin up after him, like, you know, like, you know, follow that. White people, everybody leaving. Robin would Try make them all. Yeah, man, he would sit them right back down and do his act, like he was at that. That, but he would, you know, it was like okay, he's comedy act, but he knew it was a different audience. So he hit him with whap whap the same jokes, but hit him with a hit him with it with a different way and blap blap. And they was, man, it was like whoa, dude, this dude is that dude, man. <laughs> you didn't get to see him. You didn't get to see him work, man. You missed. You missed yeah. a master yeah. class. Yeah. I said that he was getting you ready for those hood spots because the hood spots are the hardest yeah. places to ever perform. Yeah. Point blank, period. Some of these other places you can go to and people come to actually have a good time. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> they're coming to yeah, laugh. Yes. Like they want to laugh. Right. They're, they're looking for, they don't, they're, they'll laugh without any alcohol. Yeah. You go to some of these hood spots, they are coming to be impressed. Yeah, yeah you're right, there. That's the word. Impress me. <laughs> what you got? I already heard it. You <laughs> said that last week. Some of the best comedy that I ever seen in my life was in L.A., in the L.A. area. It was mm. actually Long Beach at Birdland. Oh, that Birdland West. I used to go to Birdland West. Oh, my God. Anytime that I was in the city when I wasn't working, when we wasn't on the road. Was T.K. hosting back then or D.L.? D.L. was hosting. D.L. was hosting. Yeah, it took over for TK. Yeah, it did. Okay, yeah. I would go to Birdland, bro. Yeah. I would get, listen to what I'm saying. I live in Houston. I know. But I'm flying to L.A. To Long Beach. To Long Beach, <laughs> to go to Long Beach, just to watch comedy. Wow. Oh, I'm a comedy connoisseur, okay, Patty. Right, okay. I, 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 saw the, I, I saw the early, the first in the workings, DL jokes and the, yeah. the Jamie Foxx jokes yeah, and the, yeah, I, yeah. I saw all of that stuff, yeah, yeah. you know, early on. Yeah, you know, I think I may have seen you up there at Birdland before. You may, you may have. I can't. I, I used to come through there. I never yeah. really hosted. I come to do specials. My man Sanders, Greg Sanders, used you to come run up there. Do, yeah, Greg Sanders, he was on. Yeah, wrap it up. up there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. In fact, see, Greg, Greg was. Very good friends with my buddy Reggie Johnson, who's a three-time uh, boxing champion right, right, uh, right. in the middleweight and di- light heavyweight division. Right. So he, me, and Reggie used to hang out when we'd go there. Okay. And so that was always the spot that was we would always end up there. We wouldn't even go anywhere else, man. Yeah. We just like that was like, it. You go to Berlin, you don't need to go nowhere else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and they yeah they have some cuties in there. Oh yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. but the there. best. I'm talking about. Listen, man, I I didn't even know that was a such thing as a professional heckler. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, listen, bro, the hecklers at Birdland was so good they could give you five ten minutes. Yeah, and and, and I'm talking about back to back to back to back to back. So yeah. finally, somebody was all right, man. All right, all right, all right yeah, go ahead and stop now. Yeah, let's, exactly. let's get let's keep the show going. Yeah. That was some good comedy, man. That's yeah. some of the best days of my life, man. Yeah, but Berlin, yeah, people miss those those. those I guess this day and era, miss those kind of clubs that that got you right. You know, yeah. gave you longevity to the day. 
Man, those still fans are still, like, I got fans that are, like, you know, 70, 80 years old, 75, still coming to my shows because I've been in the game, like, almost 35 years now. So if, yeah. they were, if they were 40 or 50 then, you know what I'm saying, grown folks, they are still fans, not early, like, into the 70s and some 80s, and I'm like, wow, so... So. That's good stuff, man. Thirty years, bro. I mean, that's yeah. that's thirty plus years, three decades in the game. Yeah, man. I mean, Bless the me. relationships that you've you've built, you know, the stories that come with those relationships, man. you know, the experiences, <laughs> man. When's the book? Have you done a book yet? It's coming. It's coming. The book is coming. Everybody, we gonna write the book. It's because the trip part yeah. about it is that. Yeah. Not only do you know everybody, everybody know you. And it seemed like to me like like so many people have been touched by you in some kind of way. You know what I'm mm. saying? Like, and that's something that people don't know of. And that's because I think you don't really go around telling people, yeah, I did this, yeah, I did this. <laughs> I did. A lot of times people gotta say, hey, you know, well, how did you meet how did you meet this person? Or what happened? Right. Say, oh yeah, you know, we met like this and da da da, you know. That's how it kind of comes out. But man, you that dude, dog, like uh-huh. You that dude, Thank man. You, man. Like that is, is your resume is impressive. Like you, uh, I heard was at Richard's bedside, Richard Pryor's bedside yeah. when he was ill. Yeah. What was that like? Well, to see him, um, see, because it was like a a, a span. He's it like he would, he was well. He was, yeah, it wouldn't didn't really hit him yet when I first met him. Uh, he was with his wife, Flynn. Um, and I did a comedy show with him in Atlanta, you know, um, I, I, I you touched Atlanta the show. stage with Richard Pryor. Richard Pryor, Richard Pryor hosted the show, man. Oh, man. Yeah. And it was, it was, man, it was, oh, it was yeah, man. man, I had lined the show. I still got the flyer. You, and what you drank that night? You had, you, 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 I, I hey, know man, you toasted that I, night. I, I, man, I mean, well, that was my, my first time meeting him and then went back to the house, um, to her house and, you know, and then, and, and just talking to him and then meeting him and that, then, then I re- got that relationship. So when he was out in LA, I would go because the, um, the, his disease start, really started kicking in. So he couldn't really leave the house. So I used to go to his mansion in Moraga Drive because he was like maybe like five, ten minutes away from me. And I used to check in him on Mondays when I got back and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday before I left. And sometimes he'd let me come sit and talk and, you know, to him with me because he's big, a big old mansion by himself. The housekeeper had left. And, you know, Flynn was living in Atlanta with her kids, the two kids that she had by him, because she wasn't moving to L.A., so she would come to visit. So I was like, okay. I, you know, I was like, it's okay to go by there? And he was like, yeah. Sometimes he was cool with it. Sometimes he wasn't. But he would let me in, and I would sit there and, you know, and just, just get knowledge, man, ask him certain things about comedy and just life. And he'd just sit there and just listen to him, just talk, and just be, just be like, a, you know, I'm here. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I, I can believe that you, actually somebody like this would let me in, but I'm like... And you know, here I go again. It's like I, I, I tell everybody I pray to be in the right place at the right time, to always be aligned with what I'm, what my purpose is. And, you know, and, and, and I ask for that every day, and I try to focus on it every day, and it happens. Get off the plane here, you know what I'm saying? When I get off the plane, but drove here, 75 AMC Hornet, graduated college, and I'm the first big movie I'm doing as an extra is Harlem Nights with all my stars in it. <laughs> Red Fox was cool. Eddie Murphy, Richard Pryor, Sammy Davis Jr. walked past me one day. I mean, that's all I needed. He came on the set and just, man, I'm like, I didn't meet him, but he walked past me and I said, hey, Mr. Jackson. I mean, it's just Davis. He was there. And he kept moving, but he came to see Eddie. He was on a lot, and I was like, wow, I must be doing something right. I, I, I wanted to get a time, take a picture, but that part right there, man, was, I, I, never, I never forgot it. So things like that just keep happening. Right place, right time. I remember the time video with, I was in that before Poetic Justice. John Singleton put me in that. That's me and Tiny chasing Michael through the whole movie. That's how big I was. I was like 205 back then. I was beastie for a 5'8 person, but anyway, or 5'7 or however you want to call me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah, man, I just, right place, right time, man. And, and, it, and it keeps happening like that. I just try to wake up and try to be in the right place, the right time. Um, and, and one of my books is going to be, you know, it's called like, you know, um, Fame, Family, Fun, and Friends. You know what I'm saying? 30 years of, you know, fame, family, fun, and friends. And I just dive into, you know, so many, because I have footage from all of that, and I got so many stories. So it can't just be one book. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's, you know, it's 30 years of it. So that's why I kind of title it up under and uh, you know, sit back, man. I, I got some stories coming. The Joe Torrey what, stories. What's going on with Joe Torrey TV? Joe Torrey TV, that's a building my own Joe Tube. 
That's it. Getting content, just you know, so in case they can't cancel you off your own, your own too, your own stuff. So I have so much content from so many years of stuff, you know, that I've done and 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 been involved with. But when you go down to Joe Tube, you also go down Willie Tube. It's like a rabbit hole. You also mm -hmm. go so I'm just building my stuff, and I have so much content that I can't just put it on one one channel or one station. So I'm just building my own station. So that's mm -hmm. Joe Torrey TV, and it, it's going to cover, you know, where, where you can go there and you can be able to, you know, learn something about your health, learn something about some cooking, learn something about some intelligence, black intelligence, you know, uh, black, our black history. You know I'm saying one of my things now is to, um, and I'm, I'm working on this Miles Davis story, but to, to show all our black heroes in good light. You know what I'm saying? So if they taking us out of the history books, well then, okay. Then where's the James Baldwin story? You know what I'm saying? Where is the where is that, that story about the, the Miles Davis story that I am gonna do that's showing him in a good light? The King of Cool. Mm -hmm. We always gotta talk about, you know, the bad part of him, but no, he had some happy times in his life and we're gonna show them. Well, well, all, all those... well what at what capacity are you working on the Miles Davis movie? Um, series, a series is a series, is uh we're showing Miles and like 1965 miles and 1975 miles. I don't, not to so you're the executive the producer or you're acting in it also? I'm acting, executive producer. Yeah. Wanna, What's your role? You know, I'm playing Miles. You, you're playing Miles? Playing Miles. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, that's what I'm mean, morphing down for the last two yeah. years, two, three years. And when can we expect that? Um, we're, gonna, we're doing a screen test like uh, later this month. You know what I'm saying? Because I had to lose weight. I, I was mm -hmm. too big at first. I was, you know, on the screen. So when I it was getting a proper makeup person and a, then me with the proper, I had to lose Man, all the weight in my some face. You got some features too, yeah, bro. Yeah, so yeah. So when you do it, it's yeah. like, I see it now. And I'm like, yeah. lips. And so, but I didn't see it at first because Miles' face is chiseled. So I had to yeah. get my face chiseled. I had to lose my traps mm -hmm. and my pecs because my pecs stuff all out. Miles was cut, but he wasn't buff. You know what I'm saying? He wasn't yeah. thick with it. So right. I'm like, so he was lean. He's lean with it. So now on camera, I can get away with looking lean in the face and the neck. You know what I'm saying? And then, because the, the year we're doing him, is, you know, he was, you know, we, we ain't showing him all, you know, we're showing him in good light. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's that. But uh, that's my, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's the biggest thing I'm doing next. Um, besides trying to show all our, um, all our, all our black Wall Street heroes. That's nothing, you know, that I'm, I'm working on is all the inventors, who are they? Got over a hundred something black inventors you don't know about until Black History Month. Where's their story? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Where's 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 that where's that story? That do you know? We know Jack Johnson created the, the wrench, but he has seven other patents. Now you've seen a Jack Johnson story, but what about all those other guys who invented stuff? All those black Wall Street who owned the bank. Where's that guy who owned the, the transportation company? Where's where where are those heroes that were bombed? You know what I'm saying? Our black heroes. I'm like, mm -hmm. where's those stories at? I mean, not against. All these country stories, Yellowstone, and you know, and all these Lord of the Rings, and all. This. Okay, cool, but where's our Black History stories? Where's mm -hmm. where you know where's? And I'm, it's it's my it's my job to like in our areas got to get those stories out there. I ain't playing all the parts, but I want to be able to produce them, and to you know show people in good light, you know, that who we are as kings and queens, and as innovators in this world, creators, inventors, and I'm saying scientists, chemists, you know, all that stuff. Where's you know what I'm saying? It's more than just, you know, the ones that they show us. So mm -hmm. that's my mission. Is it fair to say that Robin Harris is the, the first guy in comedy that really had the resources to grab you by the coattail and kind of like show you the way what was going on out here? Um, or was there somebody else that had more of an impact on you first? Uh, I mean, the first person that had an impact on was Robin Harris. Because he was the man. And when he passed, he left, like, everything open, like, for all of us. Def Jam, sitcoms. I mean, it was like, he was the next one. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So he left a whole door slew that we're still filling his shoes with. You know what I'm saying? Where were you when you got the news? Um, Actually, I was supposed to be with him. I was supposed to open for him, but we also opened uh, the Comedy Act Theater in Atlanta that same weekend. And, you know, so he was doing this special in Chicago, and I was headlining the one in Atlanta and I, I heard about it when uh, I got back off the plane that Sunday uh, you, for, you know you heard about it the person picked me up and you're on radio it was just all over the place and I, I didn't even go home I just was like whoa my girlfriend at the time I was like she was like you didn't hear and I was like oh no and then back then you didn't have cell phones and you know nothing like that pagers <laughs> it was you know, yeah. it was like you just gotta keep listening to the radio and, and, and hope you see it on the news And but it was back, back then it was just more black radio you know you had to keep listening to that station and see if it was really true how did it affect your emotional state and the way you move today 
Um, yeah, well, in my emotional state, um, be prepared for everything. You know what I'm saying? You, you know, be careful what you ask for, especially if you get it all today. You got to be in shape for it. Are you ready for it? I was telling my son that the other night, okay, God gave you everything you wanted. You want this rock star life. Are you in shape for it? Can you handle it? I don't hear nothing about it. I ain't getting no sleep. I don't hear nothing about it. I'm tired. My tooth hurt. No, no, you ready for the life. You ready? I've been up and down on the plane. No sleep. In four different cities, you know what I'm saying? In three days, got to get up, down, drive. Sometimes you're driving yourself in little towns. Are you ready for that? If they want you on demand like that, are you ready for that? Seven days a week. I used to work seven days a week. But I had no family. I had no kids, so I can do that. But now when you do, are you ready for that? When you ask to be married, are you ready to be a rock star and be married and have kids? Are you ready to do them same things? Or have you learned to adjust that? And watching Robin Harris and different people do it ahead of me and ask them how they did it, take little pages out their book, but... I mean, you, you know, he, he did tell, teach me how to be a family man and, you know, and, and then move, move some of those jokes, you know, family jokes into his material. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> which, was, mm-hmm. which, was, which was awesome because I, I used to love that. I, was, I didn't have family back then, so I had jokes that were single man jokes. And, um, you know, having a family, having a wife, having some kids and having bills and having to be able to deal with what, you know, everyday life people, grown folks deal with. Is, is material that's uh, golden, and I used to see him work that. So watching him do all that in that year's time has prepared me. Um, so, you know, um, I, I felt like when he passed, he kind of passed that on to me, all of that. You know what I mean? And, it was, it, and his parents did the same thing. They kind of like, when I, when I took over the, the realm for him, they, they, they said, you got our wishes. They was even trying to tell me, you do some of his jokes. I'm like, no, I'm not doing none of his jokes. I got my own jokes. I got my own style. But, uh, but I was, you know, it was a... Uh, yeah, it, it was it was a blessing to be there, man. You know, right place, right time, again. Is there something that you saw him working on, maybe a project that he was passionate about that he did not get a chance to do hmm. while he was alive that you can share with us? Is that something it, that you know of? It, he had a television show in the works. A couple movie deals what and a television show. I don't know. I don't, I don't think it was going to be Baby Kids, but I think it was going to be something stemming from Baby Kids. Uh-huh. Yeah, because they did a cartoon about it. So him and just dealing with the wife and these terrible kids, and you know he's gonna have his own sitcom, yeah. you know, uh, you know, and and that and that back then that was before Martin, so a black man getting his own sitcom, you know, wow, because I think Living Color was was a uh, was was uh, uh, popping off back then, and but to have a black man in, in a black family, and he had it, he had all that on the table, man, he had all that on the table when he passed. Is there anything? And I'm I'm, I'm asking these questions because I'm yeah. just I'm. Robin Harris, you know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. he was that dude. And I'm just like, I, he's not here to tell his story. He was, you know, he died at such a, a young 36, age, at 36 yeah. years old. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he, and he was like at the height, really. It really wasn't at his height, but he was he was right down the cusp of superstardom. Mm. And then, boom, you know, he dies. And so there's a lot of questions that went unasked, you know. Mm. And we didn't get to see a lot of his talent. So I was just wondering, like, like, what type of person he really, what type of person was he off stage? You know, like, can you share, like, a story that <laughs> perhaps maybe gave you some advice or mm-hmm. something, y'all was somewhere and something happened that was, you know, I mean, a, a lot, wild? A lot of Robin Harris stories, playing basketball. He's eating. Robin used to whoop ass. <laughs> <laughs> he whooped some ass. Like, he didn't take those shit. <laughs> like, like physically? Ricky ass. Harris, Bart Lawrence, TK, Michael Carr, yeah, Robert Harris would put him down. He was, yeah, hold he on, did, hold he on, did not play. Yeah. Robert Harris fought, he fought. TK, Ricky Harris, Harris Michael Carr, Michael Martin. Carr, Martin. Martin. <laughs> Back in the day, we was a man, Robin didn't play about and stealing jokes. What are they jokes. fighting about? He just, Robin didn't play. Robin, 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 was, Robin was tough. He, was, he didn't play. He rolled with his pistol. He rolled with his. He rolled, He didn't play. He didn't take no shit off nobody. <laughs> That's why we got along. But yeah, Robin would let you know. And then, you know what I'm saying? But it was a. But Robin had this sleepy thing, you know. And this is what everybody would know. That, you know, Robin could be driving, and driving his 5.0, that Mustang, and be talking to you, listen to the blues. And then he, you, know, you see him going dozing off. And you'd be like, Robin, you know, wake up. But that's when you kind of knew when he passed. Like, what's wrong? Why is he always falling asleep? Is his sleep apnea? Is there something going mm-hmm. wrong with his? But he was, he was, he was, he was, he would fall asleep every now and then. At the mm-hmm. table sometimes, you see him on uh, Kizzy's, you know what I'm saying? That's a soul food restaurant, you know what I'm saying? Those little th- signs you knew that, okay, is he working? Is he tired? 
But then when you know when he passed, it was like you know it probably would happen when he had a heart attack. He probably you know, you know I don't know if he couldn't catch his breath right after a big show. You know what I'm saying? And but it, yeah, it wasn't because they worked him to death. No, he was he was ready. He was ready for work. Did you spend any considerable time around John Witherspoon? Yeah, yeah, John was John was my guy, man. Yeah, yeah, John was my guy, man. Yeah, John, John Witherspoon is another is, uh, one of those. Man, you have yeah. been around the biggest of the biggest comedy stars. Yeah. In the game, I mean, these guys that everybody calling goats and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any one of these guys, people, okay, that's my goat. That's my goat. That's my goat. John Witherspoon was like, uh, he he was like an impromptu genius. Yeah, you know? he was. He was he was an improv genius. Yeah. And and also he was a writer too back in the day. So he yeah. you know he came up in the Richard Pryor days. Have you ever seen those old roasts with him and Robin Williams and yeah. they used to be on and Paul Moody and and Robin would be on them too. But him and David Letterman were best friends. Mm-hmm. And he was I think he was the best man in David Letterman's wedding. Um, and but and David Letterman he also came to to his service when he passed and all that. So they were good friends. Um, but but Rob, I mean I'm, John was John was. Always, man. Always, uh, that's a real person. Like you, like if you t- see that character, you know, in the movie. I mean, he would just take it to another level. You know, see him in person. Um, but always funny. I mean, and transfer that on stage. But I think he learned from him. I mean, he, two different type of comedians because he 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 did comedy in the sixties, seventies, eighties, nineties, two thousands. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And and you love them. You love you love them as pops. And I'm like, man, that's those are the kind of careers you want. Those are the kind. Those are my mentors right there. You know, when, yeah. when I. When I, and I and I when I'm on tour with them, you just want to go to their dressing room and sit there and suck up a lot of knowledge. Um, and and that's the last time we were talking. I was on tour with him. He's like, yeah, they working the shit out of me, man. <laughs> it was me, him, Bruce, Bruce. It was on we was on some tour, and he was like, they working the shit out of me, Joe. But he and, liked it though. Yeah, because because it was a period where he wasn't working mm-hmm. as a comedian, and then oh, he did a couple movies, bam. Pop, pop, that's pops. And he just go out there and do that stuff, and that's all people wanted. Yeah. Like like you're saying, when you see Joe Witherspoon, you're already ready to laugh. Right. <laughs> you really got to do nothing. You already, you already ready for this person. Oh, here, go, come with it, John. And he just go into his, his stuff and, you know what I'm saying? That's, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's golden stuff right there, man. I know that we, we all got to go, right? We all got to go at some yeah. point. You oh, know, yeah. We all got to... We we all got a expiration date. Yeah, but you've worked with a lot of people who have died. I yeah, mean, a yeah. lot of people. Yeah. Uh, how much does uh, those memories? Uh, how 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 heavy do they weigh on you? Do you think about like your own? Does it make you think about your own mortality? You know. Uh, is that something you're cognizant of thinking about, or is it just something like, hey, you know, that's the way it is, and you, you know, that's just what it is? Uh, and the reason why I'm asking is because, you know, there's a certain preparation that each of us need to have. Right. You know, uh, when we, you know, at in our life, we gotta have, we gotta prepare for that because we know it's coming. You know, how how does how do you like um, how do you process that? Um. I, I mean, every day. I mean, you, I take every day to its fullest. And now I know my purpose. I really don't trip off stuff like that because my purpose is light. You know what I'm saying? So I've added light throughout the years. Mm-hmm. I try to add light wherever I go. And light don't explain itself. It just is. You know what I'm huh. saying? It just is. It's on. So okay. if you can't take it, you either, you know, light don't dim itself down. If the bulb is too, too bright for you, that should put some shades on. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But hey, it, when man. God got me beaming, I'm yeah. just there. And when he, and when, yeah. you know, but I can't go anywhere because you just said, you know, it's 30 years, it's history, people growing up on me. Um, and it's, I have stuff that's out there. You know, it's not in a book yet, but it is on film. So, mm-hmm. you know, I'm I'm never going anywhere. Just like when people ask about Tupac, Tupac seems like he's still here because he's, he's got so much stuff, so much work out there. Yeah. So, um, and, and and with me, and when I go, I'm at peace. I'm at peace. I'm at a point where I'm I'm at peace. I ain't really trying to be no superstar. I ain't really trying to be no you know that. Ben did 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 all that. You can I did all the things I accomplished to do, and now it's just get it by kids into it, making sure that you know that they, you know when I pray this prayer of Jabez, which is the shortest prayer in the Bible, expand my territory, and you know you you can't you can't live you can't live that long. That's you know what I'm saying? Prayer? Well, it's, it's my, what is it say? to expand my to expand my territory and to, you know to and be east the land and, and to me I was thinking yeah in the business and my brand but 
God was saying, no, you cannot live my prayer. You need sons. You need generations. When you pray a prayer to expand me and my territory and your worth and your light, you can't live that long. But your kids can, and you can in film, and you can on books, and all these things I'm telling you about, you can live there. But, I mean, when your purpose is, is done as a human being on this earth, I mean, you're going to... I'm 58 right now. I mean, how much more are you going to get out of me? You know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm. It's there. But I know that whenever it happens, you know what I'm saying? I, I'm in, I'm in, I was in the, illum I'm, I'm in the illuminating light field. I was trying to add light. I wasn't trying to do nothing. I am doing something. And my kids are doing something. And we're talking about it now. So, you know, I'm, I didn't waste this time. You know what I'm saying? I'm on, this body going to be wore the fuck out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I don't waste no time. I don't waste no minutes. I don't, you know, not even arguing on, on, on you know, if I don't, I don't stay mad at people long. Over it. You know what I'm saying? If I said my piece, I'm done. Yeah, your, your body of work is so vast that it does immortalize you to an extent. To a no. great extent. Yeah, it's going to be hard to miss you. You know, like, it'll be mm -hmm. hard to miss you because every way you look, there he is. Well, it's, there he is again. There it, he is. Or, or somebody else lives. Oh, it's, exactly. I'm tied to you're, Regina you're, King. Exactly. I'm tied to Tupac. I'm tied right. to Michael Jackson. I'm tied to um, um, uh, to whatever and, and music is. what's the connection with Michael? The Remember the Time video. Remember the Time. Yeah. Remember the Time. Hold on. What, what, you, what, you, what you doing at... I was, I was, that was Tiny. Remember Tiny Lister? That was Tiny. Yeah. We was chasing him through the whole movie. That was, I was that big. I, I got a picture of it. You can see it. It's so oh, wow. huge. Yeah, it is. I'm so huge at the time. And that was before Party Justice. John put me in that movie. But that was, we met Mike and talked. Mike is cool. Yeah. Mike was cool. So I got to work with Mike. <laughs> what Mike tell you? What Mike tell you off camp? No, you know what? Mike was just being <laughs> funny, man. He was just being real. Yeah. Tiny was making him laugh, like making his pecs jump. He was like, you're silly. He said, stop it. We're about to do this. And then he would come on. He fuck, fuck. But I'm talking about a real professional. I'm talking about somebody who came. He'd never rehearsed with those dancers. He just came and watched them. It's like, okay, I got it. Came back. And I was like, are you serious? <laughs> and the monkeys on the set. We got to mess with bubbles. Yeah, Mike, Mike was cool. Mike was cooler than Eddie. Yeah. Mike wasn't running around with bodyguards or nothing. Eddie had bodyguards running and following him. Mike was the coolest man. He would see he was standing behind me looking at the at the thing one time. I didn't even know he was behind me. And I just heard this voice. He was looking at the uh, I was looking at the, the playback. Uh, yeah. And John was sitting next to me and he was and then I just heard some uh it was so man, the voice was so clear like it was coming from the heavens. <laughs> Can I see that again? And I was there was this woman behind me and he was like, It's okay, you can stay there and I was like <laughs> and his voice was like, he's just talking on note. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, you're right behind me. He's like, yeah, right there. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, I got a job. Too. Hey, you guys, how you doing? Everybody's what? And, and just walked back. Just went back to his trailer where, where he had a lot of Arabs where he was. <laughs> he went back to where he was. But it was like he stayed there for a minute. He had a lot of Arabs. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, back then and then right, it was like, right, yeah, right. whatever. Yeah, his, tra his trailer was inside yeah. the studio, but then it was, oh, he did. He, he was dealing with some sheiks. <laughs> <laughs> Eddie had his crew. Mike had some Arabs. <laughs> I was like, yeah. oh, this is, some, this is some money. Where were you when Mike died when you finally got the news? Um... I think I was, where was I? I, I think I was in L.A. You know, or home? somewhere. Um, I think I was in the gym. Because I think it, yeah. I was at home, man. And I think I saw it on the, on the it was coming across the TV thing. Yeah. It was like, and I was in the gym and I was like, what the hell? Yeah, because they were taking him out of the, taking him out of the home. Yeah, yeah. I remember that. I was looking yeah. up in the gym and I was like, what? And it was like, and he, yeah, come bring him out of his home. And he, I was like, oh, man. Mm -hmm. And it just, you know, okay. You know what I'm saying? Killed my workout. <laughs> Back then, you're like, yeah. oh, come on, really? Because usually it's something with Mike. When you live in L.A., it's mm -hmm. always something with Mike. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's, it's doing the trial, it's this and that, but that right there was like, okay, now, you, wow. Yeah. So, you know what I'm saying? Like, wow, finally, man. How many kids do you have? Three. Three two kids. Boys. Two boys and one girl. And one girl. Yeah. Now, how old are your kids? The oldest one's 29. Um... My 20-year-old son, he'd be about to be 21 mm -hmm. next month, and my 13-year-old, about to be 14. Who do you worry about the most? My daughter. 
Yeah, <laughs> the girl. Got to. <laughs> hey, man, who worries me the most? <laughs> yeah, right. Her. Yeah, yeah. I get some money, cash app, hair, you know, like just everything. It's the, you know, but she's very smart. But yeah, her. Because she, you know, she's my 29 year old. I used to worry about him a lot. Because, mm-hmm. you know, he was, you know, he was back and forth. He was the baby mama baby. Is so, that the one know, doing the comedy? Yeah, that's the one doing comedy. He's yeah. like 6'2", 225. He's a big dude, man. He, yeah. he, he, he be 30. He want to listen, don't listen. Think he got it, don't got it. You know what I'm saying? But I'm like, hey, you on your own now. So, you know, you better listen. You know, but And my 21-year-old, he got he, he just he just got it. He just how, so easy going how, and so talented. How, how frustrating is it to know what you know, to have your son... Have enough sense to follow in your footsteps, mm-hmm. but not listen to your advice. Exactly. <laughs> it's like just, That's just crazy. Yeah, it's like they don't want right. to hear. They want to hear from everybody else, but pop right. and and people tell them like, dude, you better go. Your dad, because I used to be the mechanic. I still am, but back in the day, I was known as a mechanic. Where I would help you fix your jokes. You know what I mean? Because yeah. I was like, you know, and I still help people do that. I, you know, because I was okay. like, you know, play your instrument. I play bongos. I play. I'm a percussionist. So I'm come out here and try to play drums when you play the flute or you play the piano or you play a drum or you play a guitar. Play your do you go do you. So you can't, can't see somebody else. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna try that. No, go play your song. Go play. Go do what you do. Let me tighten you up so to keep you in the groove. Everybody can't be a screwdriver. Okay, we need a whole toolbox. So when you're doing a show, find your way. Find your look at yourself at your instrument and play your way in that part that nobody's played before. You know what I'm saying if you could play all the percussions, you can play all the whole band like Jamie. You can do personation, sing, and Tommy Davis. And some people got the whole kit and how to unleash it. But find out where you are and then what what audience is that best for. And then you know, the pressure ain't on you. Well, thank God you found out who you are. <laughs> oh, hey! <man. okay. laughs> and the audience found you, and there is no pressure. Hey, man, ain't no pressures on them. There you go. <laughs> it ain't on me, baby. Ladies I'm teaching class. Joe Torrey. Thank you, man. Thanks for coming on the show. Hey, man, thanks for having me, man. Yeah, yeah. Root to the cues. No more talk. No more talk. Yeah.